Thank you for standing by. My name is Bailey, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Rocket Lab third quarter 2024 fiscal results update and conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, again, press the star and one. I would now like to turn the call over to Mario Baker, Senior Communications Manager at Rocket Lab. You may begin. Thank you. Hello and welcome to today's conference call to discuss Rocket Lab's third quarter 2024 financial results. Now, before we begin the call, I'd like to remind you that our remarks may contain forward-looking statements that relate to the future performance of the company, and these statements are intended to qualify for the safe harbour protection from liability established by the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act. Any such statements are not guarantees of future performance, and factors that could influence our results are highlighted in today's press release, and others are contained in our filings with the Security and Exchange Commission. Such statements are based upon information available to the company as of the date hereof and are subject to change for future developments. Except as required by law, the company does not undertake any obligation to update these statements. Our remarks and press release today also contain non-GAAP financial measures within the meaning of Regulation G enacted by the SEC. Included in such release and our supplemental materials are reconciliations of these historical non-GAAP financial measures to the comparable financial measures calculated in accordance with GAAP. Now, this call is also being webcast with a supporting presentation and a replay and copy of the presentation will be available on our website. Our speakers today are Rocket Lab founder and Chief Executive Officer Sir Peter Beck, as well as Chief Financial Officer Adam Spice. They will be discussing key business highlights, including updates on our launch and space systems programs. And we will discuss the financial highlights and outlook before we finish by taking questions. So with that, let me turn the call over to Sir Peter. Thanks, Marielle, and uh, thanks for everybody joining us today. Um, before we take you through the achievements of the quarter, I'd like to remind everybody what every launch, uh, every development milestone, every spacecraft we build is working towards. Rocket Lab is an end-to-end -end space company. We provide the, the ride to space with our launch vehicles, and we build the spacecraft to do the work in orbit. This ultimately gives us the keys to space, unlocking the largest market of all space applications. <coughs> With, excuse me, with, with phase one and two, the rockets and the spacecraft now well established, we're, we're well positioned to create our own constellations to provide in-demand services and capabilities in space. In Q3, we strengthened this position with a few key achievements, including the signing of a multi-launch deal for Neutron with a commercial constellation operator. And we've been very considered in the way that we've approached Neutron's first commercial contracts. And I look forward to sharing more uh, on, on this later in the call. On the small rocket front, uh, we successfully launched multiple electron missions in Q3 and signed $55 million in new, uh, <coughs> excuse me, new electron launch contracts. <coughs> excuse me. A testament to strong and growing demand for dedicated small launch and acknowledgement of electrons position. As for space systems, I'll be sharing updates on various programs, but uh, one key uh, call out is the Mars sample return contract study. Anybody who's familiar with uh, Mars Sample Return understands NASA believes their current mission architecture is too costly or take too long, so they've requested innovative new proposals to deliver samples sooner and bring the cost down. We are delighted to be selected by NASA to put forward a study into how Rocket Lab would achieve this, and I'm very excited to share in more details about our proposal to support the mission today. And of course, to deliver space systems at scale, you need to be able to pump out constellations of spacecraft quickly and cost effectively. I'm proud to share that our spacecraft production line in Long Beach is churning out spacecraft at a faster rate than ever, which builds with builds underway for a backlog of more than 40 spacecraft. All of these achievements and capabilities feed into our final strategic pillar, being able to build and launch and operate our own constellations. I'll address it right up front, that, uh, w right up front which is that we're not ready to re reveal details on what this constellation or application may be. Uh, but I think it's important to understand the strong foundation we've built up across launch and space systems to enable it in due course. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. On to some quick financial highlights for Q3. We delivered, delivered another really strong quarter with positive metrics across the business. 
The third quarter revenue topped out at $105 million, within a million dollars of our record revenue achieved last quarter. That's a 55% revenue increase year on year, while our backlog has grown 80% year on year to set at $1.05 billion at the end of September. I'll let Adam dig into the numbers properly, but I think it's important to note um, up front that once again that we're delivering on the old uh, Rocket Lab adage and mantra of uh, we do what we say we were going to do uh, across both engineering and technical achievements, but as well as financial goals. Okay, on to Electron updates. We've reached 12 missions for the year and counting, setting a new annual launch record for Electron. Only two rockets globally launch more than Electron, that's the Falcon 9 and the Chinese Long March, making Electron one of the most globally significant rock rockets flying today. Launch cadence is one thing, but doing so in a financially sustainable way is quite another. Uh, we've sold 55 million in new Electron launch contracts in Q3, but what's really important to note about, uh, about is the, the significant increase in average sales price. This is now 60% higher than when Electron first started flying. We've brought a service to market that works, that customers needs, need, and we've proven we can scale. The cost uh, just reflects uh, how rare and sought after this capability is. Just to help visualise it, here's a snapshot of the global launch cadence uh, this year across all vehicles, and you can see Electron is right up in the top ranking in number three spot. Now, onto Electron launches for the quarter. We had three missions for three separate commercial constellation operators during Q3. Each of the missions are part of multi-launch contracts with return customers. Electron provides a vital sought-after service for small sat constellation operators who want to be in control of their orbits, launch schedule, and mission parameters in a way that's just not possible on large rideshare missions. We had another quick turnaround uh, between missions two, launching Electrons back-to-back -back from Launch Complex 1 within just eight days of each other. Speaking of fast turnarounds, after Q3, we completed another record uh, launch in record time. We launched a mission for a confidential constellation operator just 10 weeks after signing contract. This kind of speed is pretty well unheard of in the space industry. It's typical to take a year to go from contract to orbit. And of course, that causes bottlenecks and limited launch opportunities for satellite operators. Electron has plugged this gap, getting a satellite operation on orbit faster so they can you know, test, test their technology sooner, begin generating revenue for constellation, constellations earlier, or collect urgent data uh, from space um, on, on demand. I've discussed at length previously that launch is a lumpy business. Uh, it's common for customers to request delays and new launch dates, causing a constant manifest shuffles. Uh, causing, causing const, constant manifest shuffles. Uh, this results in an ever-changing fluid launch schedule, but because we have a factory of rockets and three launch sites standing by to support, we can slot new customers in as these gaps uh, open up quickly. And now I'm sure the software team will laugh at me for this, but uh, in reference to ultimate flexibility, it's a feature and not a bug of the Electron business model, especially as we collect up to 90% of the contract value for every mission before launch day with revenue recognised on launch. So if a launch slips a month here or there, uh, the overall in impact to the business is pretty well negligible. Right, moving on from small launch onto Neutron updates. Okay, so we've signed a launch agreement with a Constellation operator, uh, which encompasses two very early launches on Neutron. Thanks to our proven track record with uh, Electron, uh, the space industry has come to expect high-performing, reliable launch vehicles from Rocket Lab. Because of this, we've worked with a lot of different customers for Neutron's first few missions, but we're, we're in the fortunate position to be able to choose who flies first and have made a careful and considered, considered strategic decisions around that. We see this agreement as, as a, an important opportunity that signifies the beginning of a productive collaboration that could see Neutron deploy this particular customer's entire constellation. I'm confident in these two launches will be the first of many more to come from this particular customer. Now, we've really been methodical about uh, when we open the bookings on Neutron 2. Uh, it's, it's all too common in the space industry for aspiring launch providers to sign non-binding agreements and sell missions at a loss to, de to, fund, de to fund development. We know uh, that it's better to bring a real rocket to the market um, first and to command a premium price. As we draw closer to Neutron's debut next year, conversations with customers and demands for launch slots have started to mature. As everyone will expect, um, I'm very happy to say that the contract value, um, this particular contract value, is in family with our standard uh, neutron pricing for launches. Uh, 
Of uh, what, one of the programs that Neutron has been ideally suited for from day one um, was when we conceived the vehicle was the US's um, Space Force National Security Space Launch Program or NSSL. The Space Force recently opened up the RFPs for the program, uh, program's next Lane 1 on-ramp, which will see us compete to qualify for a share of up to $5.6 billion of national security launches. There is an unnerving bottleneck in the medium launch market currently, creating a risk for national security. Uh, bringing new launch capability to NSSL is a critical uh, to increasing the DOD's diversity of opportunities, assuring access uh, to space for national security, and with our proven track record, market-leading design and established infrastructure, Neutron is a, is a pretty compelling choice. We're well past the design phase, now moving into Neutron's build and test campaigns. Keeping our schedule for the first launch next year puts us inside the 2025 year-end time frame sought by the Space Forces for the next on-ramp. We bought uh, a new vehicle to market before with Electron, which is a reliably de delivered national security payload uh, to, payloads to orbit for several years. And with Electron, we reached 50 launches faster than any other commercially developed rocket in history. So we, we know how to do this, and we know how to, to do this well. Government interest in Neutron's development is ramping up in other areas too. Uh, this quarter, we're awarded an, an $8 million study contract with the US Air Force's Research Lab to showcase our digital, digital engineering prowess uh, with Archimedes. Uh, this contract has a tie-in with, with the NSSL program as well, where it includes the option to expand our digital engineering processes and further build, on, uh, build the digital engineering framework for NSSL Phase 3 Lane 1 launch providers. This contract is a bit of a win-win when it comes to defence industry partnerships. It not only allows the US Air Force to collaborate with industry leaders like the Archimedes team to help develop and modernise the US Air Force's engineering processes and capabilities, but it also supports smooth integration of Neutron into the NSSL program to more efficiently and quickly provide for some of the nation's most critical missions. Elsewhere across the DoD, the US Transcom has extended our 2022 research agreement uh, that allows us to continue to explore point-to-point -point cargo delivery with Neutron. And we've recently received confirmation from the US Space Force's Space Systems Command that Neutron can now compete for missions under OSP4, a near billion dollar uh, indefinite delivery, delivery indefinite quantity uh, contract that we're on ramp to uh, a few, few, weeks, few years back. All right, moving on to uh, now to Neutron's development progress and some of the technical milestones we've hit this quarter. We're well past the design phase now and deep into the qualification and testing um, of our large scale flight hardware. Starting with the reusable cap captive fairing uh, for Neutron, or as we like to call it, the Hungry Hippo, these fairing halves remain attached to Neutron's first stage for the, first, uh, for the full flight, simply opening to release the payload in the second stage before closing back and returning back to Earth with the rest of stage one ready for another flight. These fairing halves will soon be going through their mechanical testing before assembly and integration onto the large scale composite panels and a seven metre wide barrels that make up the first stage. Another big milestone was the recent successful test of the second stage. We conducted its first wet dress rehearsal in a flight configuration, going through the pressures, mechanical loads, processes and procedures that would be seen in flight operations. Part of the test campaign included onboard avionics taking command and control of the stage and demonstrating pressurisation, fill, drain and coal flow oper operations. This has been one of the biggest integrated milestones yet, proving out not only the flight hardware but also the supporting infrastructure to operate the vehicle. We have flight hardware in production for all other neutron composite structures, including the barrels and domes for the vehicle's first stage propellant tank. All of the internal propellant management devices, the avionics, are on track for integration to the stage one tank um, before it goes through the same set of uh, test and, and test campaign as the second stage has just done. Now on to Archimedes. Um, we've talked about it before, uh, our approach before with Archimedes, and how we were strategic in taking our time to bring a flight-ready engine to the test stand. That means we could hit the ground running to qualify it rather than mess around with early prototypes needing lots, lots of design tweaks and changes uh, and, and, uh, in manufacturing that would, would ultimately slow the program down. We've seen that strategy really pay off um, in these past few months. Our engine test cadence in Mississippi has doubled over the quarter and we brought multiple engines to the test stand. The thing to point out here too is that a rocket engine program is never a one and done scenario. Archimedes engines will go through short burst tests, full duration hot fires and tweaks all the way up to Neutron's first flight. 
So far, though, we have continued to see strong performance from the Archimedes, and we're able to iterate um, updates rapidly, which is really where you want to be in this, this point, in, uh, point in time in the test campaign. All that to say is that the cornerstone of any rocket program depends on how quickly and reliably you can scale engine production in parallel. I know I've said it before, but it bears repeating because building your first rocket engine is hard. Building it 10, 20, 50 times and at pace that can keep up with demand is even harder. With that in mind, we continue to scale production for Archimedes at the same time uh, that we're testing it. We've got the assembly line in California humming with engines shipping out uh, the door frequently to Mississippi, uh, setting us up well to get into a good launch cadence um, with Neutron after first flight. A rocket program is much more than just a vehicle, of course, and its engines. Uh, launch infrastructure is a critical component and one of the pieces that we've had a bit of practice to thanks to having stood up three pads on uh, two hemispheres with Electron. Uh, launch sites are a, bit, a little bit like an iceberg. There's, there's so much of the infrastructure that is underground or hidden in the development phase. With that now well established, we're starting to put the finishing touches on the above ground infrastructure, including a massive 165-ton steel structure um, launch mount that, that will hold down and hold down mechanisms. Uh, it's from this structure that Neutron will lift off next year. The launch mount will be installed in LC3 in the, in the coming few weeks, and from there the focus will start to shift to pad commissioning before Flight 1. On the ground at Launch Complex 3, some really big long lead items have made their way to the pad at Wallops Island, including two 90,000 gallon propellant tanks that were installed uh, in Q3. Each of them is longer than one of our Electron rockets, which really helps put into perspective the scale of the works that are happening at LC3. Just a few miles up the road uh, from the launch pad, we've completed the construction and of the assembly and integration and test building where Neutron's vehicles will go through their final checks before they're taken to the launch pad. Uh, having this building only three miles from the launch pad is a real strategic advantage for us, as we don't have to grapple with the slow and expensive complex logistics of you know, transporting a hulking, rocket, a hulking rocket across the country just to get to the launch pad. That wraps up, wraps up the headline items on the launch front, so now moving into space systems. So one of NASA's flagship, flagship missions is the Mars Sample Return Program, uh, which aims to bring scientifically selected uh, samples from Mars, back from Mars to Earth, to the first time in history. But NASA has said that their current architecture is too costly at $11 billion and too slow, with the samples not expected in, to be into the hands of scientists until 2040. So the agency put out a call to industry for new proposals, and I'm proud to confirm we were selected to conduct a study. We're putting forward a highly compelling concept that will return Mars rocks faster and at a fraction of the cost um, of the current cost of the program. This mission is one of the biggest, most ambitious projects NASA has ever undertaken. It will completely change the way that we think about our solar system, potentially answer whether life ever existed on Mars, and help prepare for the first human explorers on the Red Planet. While it might not be obvious at first glance, it's a mission that we're actually uniquely suited to. Now, our fingerprints are already, already all over Mars. Um, our technology has been incorporated into missions like the Mars InSight lander, the Ingenuity helicopter, and even the crew stage that brought Perseverance to Mars. Enabling the very rovers that are collecting the samples to be brought uh, to samples brought to Earth under the Mars sample return. From Orbiters and rovers, landers, crew stages, um, we have experience in delivering mission success on the red planet. Now, everything we've put into place over the, over the years, either through our own organic development or through acquisitions of, of some of the industry's leading technology suppliers, has been part of our methodical strategy to offer vertically integrated solutions for complex missions just like these. Mars sample return requires an immense depth of experience and capability, the very kind that our team and technologies have delivered on before. We have the expertise in building and launching small rockets from little planets. We have uh, the innovative Mars spacecraft. We have demonstrated re-entry capability. We've enabled rendezvous and proximity missions. We're leaders in guidance, navigation control, and our flight software is already on moon landers. And we know how to manage large and complicated missions, including ones for NASA. We've shown time and time again that we're disruptors in the industry who are able to conduct missions beyond Earth's orbit on a rapidly fast development timelines, and when others say they can't do it, we can do it at a fraction of the traditional cost. We look forward to delivering this once again for Mars Sample Return should a proposal make it through the selection process later this year. Now on to other updates across our space systems business. 
Before I dive into more specific mission updates, I want to provide a quick snapshot of just some of the various programs underway. This one is just a, this, this is just a, the latest lineup of spacecraft we're building right now, or have already completed. Like our uh, two escapade spacecraft for Mars, um, two completely different constellation spacecraft, one for cell connectivity for MDA Global Star, the other for national security and as a space development agency, and other individual technology test missions ranging from connectivity in space to cryogenic fuel storage on orbit. Beyond these missions and constellations, we continue to do strongly in our merchant space systems business with mega constellation comp contracts too. Some of you will remember me talking about scaling up um, our satellite facilities in California uh, as we bring on new and bigger spacecraft contracts. Well, part of the benefit for us taking over the previous Virgin Orbit building for pennies on the dollar for our new engine production site was it allowed us to, to use that extra space in our headquarters to be converted to our satellite production facility. We're really starting to see that strategy pay dividends with production lines um, of our various spacecraft platforms now up and running. Without, all without a single shovel in the ground, we've avoided all the headaches of having to build new buildings and factories from scratch and save precious time and resource in our, in our scaling strategy. And the beauty of having all those space systems products co-located in one building, uh, in one building there are simple ease of integration for our teams. Uh, a technician can literally walk across the floor, hand over an avionics box to a spacecraft integration team, as opposed to waiting for months for a supplier to produce it, ship it, and then deliver it. It's really the true beauty of vertical integration for our business. Now onto some more specific program updates under the space systems umbrella. And if I can stick with Mars for just uh, the Mars thing for just a little bit longer, uh, in Q3 we completed and delivered the two uh, spacecraft for the Escapade Science mission to Mars for NASA. Uh, it was a really monumental feat in itself, given the three and a half year time span handed to us uh, to deliver this mission. Unfortunately, uh, however, outside our control, the, the rocket, um, the satellites we're launching on wasn't quite ready in time for that Mars transfer window, so the mission has been uh, somewhat delayed. But uh, the team is standing by and ready to support once the new launch date is set. On to our, uh, onto our $500 million uh, prime contract with the Space Development Agency for their tranche to transport layer constellation. Now the team is hitting some great technical targets within the program. Uh, the preliminary design of the spacecraft complete. Um, the work being pulled, the, the work can begin uh, pulling the hardware together uh, in the clean rooms at headquarters. This uh, progress puts us in a strong position for the upcoming uh, solicitation of 200 satellites under the tranche three of the SDA's program. A procurement process expected to begin in 2025. And finally, to wrap up uh, space systems, our next two satellites for Varda Space Industries have been completed and are now ready for launch. Our Pioneer class space uh, satellites host Varda's capsules and provide power, communications, propulsion, and altitude attitude control for the mission. Uh, it's our first spacecraft. Our first spacecraft for Varda helped bring uh, the capsule back home from space, landing it in the Utah desert last year with our next spacecraft set to do the same thing again, but this time over Australia, where both missions are set to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and land in southern Australia, soon after launch next year. Uh, in, the, in the meantime, the team is already working on the fourth Pioneer spacecraft um, for the same VADA mission. And before I hand it over to Adam, uh, I just wanted to wrap up with a couple, of per a couple of personnel changes at the board and executive level for this past quarter. So Mike Griffin has finished up um, with uh, fin finished up on the Rocket Lab board after a four-year tenure serving the company. We're incredibly grateful for his experience and leadership, uh, helping guide Rocket Lab's growth from a private startup to a global industry leader in launch and space systems. And really want to thank him um, and give, wish him all the best as he retires from Rocket Lab's board. But as one chapter ends, another two uh, begin at Rocket Lab across board and executive level. This quarter, we welcomed Frank Klein uh, to the team as our new Chief Operations Officer. Frank joins us for, with uh, 30 years of international manufacturing experience and leadership in the automotive industry at Daimler, Mercedes Benz, and most rec recently, a prominent EV company. As a COO, Frank uh, is leading our efforts um, to scale global manufacturing of our spacecraft, launch vehicles, and spacecraft com components. And it's great to have a seasoned and experienced leader like Frank bring his wealth of knowledge in lean manufacturing and scaling to Rocket Lab. And uh, Ken Possenride also joined, uh, joined us on the Board of Directors this past quarter. Um, he joins Rocket Lab after, 30, after a 35-year uh, year career at Lockheed Martin in financial leadership, leadership positions, including serving as the Space Prime's uh, Chief Financial Officer. 
Ken's deep aerospace and defence industry uh, experience combined with his financial leadership adds to even more horsepower on an already impressive board lineup, and it's fantastic to have him on board um, to help us shape the future. So with that, um, I'll hand it over to Adam now to provide further commentary and to discuss our fin uh, financial, financial highlights and outlook. Over to you, Adam. Great. Thanks, Pete. All right. Third quarter 2024 revenue was $105 million, which was, which was at the high end of our prior guidance range and reflects significant year-on-year -year growth of 55%, driven by strong contribution from both business segments, but led by space systems. Our launch services segment delivered revenue of $21 million, in line with our prior guidance. Our current backlog continues to support our 2024 target average revenue per launch of $7.5 million, with some quarterly variability tied to volume purchase commitments, launch location, and mission assurance requirements. Our space system segment delivered $83.9 million in the quarter, near the high end of our prior guidance range of $79 million to $84 million reflecting sequential growth of over 9%, driven primarily by a strong quarter from our space solar business. Now turning to gross margin. Gap gross margin for the third quarter was 26.7%, in line with our prior guidance range of 25 to 27%. Non-gap gross margin for the third quarter was 31.3%, which was also in line with our prior guidance range of 30 to 32%. Relatedly, we ended Q3 with production-related headcount of 964, up 50 from the prior quarter. Now turn to backlog. We ended Q3 2024 with $1.05 billion of total backlog, with launch backlog of $326 million and space systems backlog of $721 million. Relative to Q3 of last year, total backlog increased 80% or $465 million primarily due to our $515 million contract award to build 18 spacecraft for the SDA and we won last year. Sequentially, there's a slight remixing of our backlog as a result of particularly strong bookings in our launch segment. We continue to cultivate a healthy pipeline, including multi-launch deals and large satellite manufacturing contracts that can create lumpiness in our backlog growth, given the size and complexities of these opportunities. We expect approximately 50% of current backlog to be recognized as revenues within 12 months. Turn to operating expenses. Gap operating expenses for the third quarter of 2024 were $79.9 million, up $9.5 million sequentially, which was at the low end of our guidance range of $80 million to $82 million. Non-GAAP operating expenses for the third quarter were $68.7 million, up $10.2 million sequentially, which was also at the low end of our guidance range of $69 million to $71 million. The sequential increases in both GAAP and non-GAAP operating expenses were primarily driven by continued growth in headcount and prototype spending to support our Neutron development program, related infrastructure IT support for Neutron, and our SDA satellite contract. In R&D specifically, GAAP expenses were up $7.8 million quarter on quarter due to Neutron prototyping, materials, and headcount growth. Non-GAAP R&D expenses were up $8.1 million quarter on quarter driven similarly to GAAP expenses. Q3 ending R&D headcount was 776, representing an increase of 103 from the prior quarter. In SG&A, GAAP expenses increased $1.7 million quarter on quarter, largely due to an increase in outside services related to legal and IT, with IT spend largely related to security and cyber requirements under our SDA contract, and legal spend driven by a range of corporate initiatives, including corporate development, as we continue to look to scale the business organically and inorganically. These legal and IT increases are paired with an increase in staff costs. Non-GAAP SG&A expenses increased $2.1 million, driven similarly to the GAAP SG&A expenses. Q3 ending SG&A headcount was 300, representing an increase of 27 from the prior quarter. In summary, total third quarter headcount was 2,040, up 180 heads from the prior quarter. Now moving to non-GAAP free cash flow and adjusted EBITDA. With regards to cash, purchases of property, equipment, and capitalized software licenses was $11 million in the third quarter of 2024, a decrease of $4.3 million from the $15.3 million in the second quarter of 2024. 
we continue our investment in neutron research, testing, and production infrastructure projects, along with expansion of our satellite production and space solar solutions capacity. And we do expect our capital expenditures to increase over the next few quarters. Cash consumed from operations was $30.9 million in the third quarter of 2024, compared to $13 million in the second quarter of 2024. The sequential increase of $17.9 million was driven primarily by increased neutron and space systems program spend and lumpiness in space systems program milestone receipts, partially offset by improved launch contract cash collections. Overall, non-GAAP free cash flow, defined as GAAP operating cash flow, less purchases of property, equipment, and capitalized software in the third quarter of 2024 was a use of $41.9 million, compared to $28.3 million in the second quarter of 2024. While we are doing better versus our targeted cash consumption run rate, we do expect a pickup in cash consumption in the next few quarters, owing to an increased uh, expected increase in neutron spending ahead of our mid-2025 launch and lumpiness in large space systems milestone payment collections. The ending balance of cash, cash equivalents, restricted cash, and marketable securities was $508 million as of the end of the third quarter of 2024. We execute Q3 in a strong position to execute on our organic expansion initiatives as well as inorganic options to further vertically integrate our supply chain with the critical capabilities and expand our addressable market, consistent with what we've done successfully in the past. Adjusted EBITDA loss was $30.9 million in the third quarter of 2024, compared to a loss of $21.2 million in the second quarter of 2024. The sequential increase of $9.7 million was primarily driven by increased spending related to neutron development. And with that, let's turn to our guidance for the fourth quarter of 2024. We expect revenue in the fourth quarter to range between $125 and $135 million. This range reflects a step up in space systems and an increase in launch cadence consistent with our prior outlook. In the past, we've broken down guidance by launch and space system segments. However, we found it difficult at best to predict launch customer readiness within a quarter and believe that providing a single top line guidance number is more appropriate at this time, given the resilience we've witnessed as a result of the expanded diversification of our business. That said, we'll continue to report actual revenues and related gross margins of launch and space systems as distinct segments. We expect fourth quarter gap gross margin to range between 26 to 28% and non-gap gross margin to range between 32% to 34%. These forecasted gap and non-gap gross margins reflect improved mix within our space system segment, primarily within satellite manufacturing, as well as better overhead cost absorption in our launch business. We expect fourth quarter GAAP operating expenses to range between $84 million and $86 million, and non-GAAP operating expenses to range between $75 and $77 million. The quarter-on-quarter increases are driven primarily by continued neutron investment in the staff costs, prototyping, and materials. We expect fourth quarter GAAP and non-GAAP net interest expense to be $1.5 million. And we expect fourth quarter adjusted EBITDA loss to range between $27 and $29 million, and basic shares outstanding to be approximately 501 million shares. And with that, we'll hand the call over to the operator for questions. At this time, I would like to remind everyone in order to ask a question, press star and the number one on your telephone keypad. Your first question comes from the line of Andre Shepard with Cantor Fitzgerald. Your line is open. Hey, everyone. Uh, Good afternoon and uh, congratulations on the quarter. Certainly a lot of uh, developments, so um, well done. Um, I guess uh, first question, just uh, on the Neutron, I just wanted to clarify. So it it sounds like you're, you know, the target for the first launch is unchanged for mid-2025, but the uh, multi-launch agreement that you disclosed today, that's targeted for, I believe, to start in middle of 2026. So I guess, A, just wanted to confirm that, and B, you know, then if that's the case, why announce this um, contract today, just given where you still are on the neutron development? A- a- any color there would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, hey, Andre, yeah, happy, happy to take that question. Um, so I think, you know, we've been pretty clear about what we expect for, for neutrons um, launch cadence to be um, so you know obviously one one test flight 
in the following year three and then five and and then continue to you know seven and, and beyond and you know that that's following pretty much the same scaling um uh you know rate as, as we saw um, that we could do with with, uh, with Electron and quite frankly I mean if you look back through history it's, it's pretty difficult to see any examples of, of a scaling rate faster than that so um, uh, so that, 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 that kind of backs into, into real um, real available slots so you know as we're talking to customers obviously they want to know when is their launch slot because they have uh, they have you know certain mission objectives from there and of course we want to know um, you know are their spacecraft going to be, be ready I think we've talked about this in the past so it, it's really just uh, you know a, a careful marry up of um, of you know various uh, you know customer requirements and, and also you know the launch slots that we've we've kind of made um, made available to customers and you know as we say on the call um, you know we, we're very very selective about um, those those uh, those especially those early slots um, you know, we need to make sure that uh, we're there on time. We need to make sure that they're on time. So, um, you know, we're we kind of we're, we're kind of easing into that that kind of gently. Um, with respect to um, announcing it now, I, mean, I think it, I think it's it's fairly material that that once we start signing a neutron contract, I think it's it's been anticipated. So, I think it was a material thing that we really would really is really would have to disclose. Yeah, and I I would add to that too. Um, Andre, that, you know, we, we've talked about the fact that, you know, as you start to approach, you know, neutron readiness, you, you think about a time frame of, you know, kind of 12, 18 months where, you know, you want to have your customer lined up because, you know, you, you got to, again, have this whole uh, synchronization to make sure that, you know, the, the, the rocket's ready. There's a long time between signing a contract usually and getting the, the actual payload integrated and launched. So I think the timing roughly worked out. Um, to that. And then, you know, I also think it's important that, you know, what we've also said, and I think Pete's been very, very consistent in this, that, you know, we were, we're not, we're, we're not going to be selling, you know, heavily discounted neutron launches just because it's a new vehicle. You know, we bring a lot of heritage to this market because of the 54 successful launches that we've had with Electron. And so it's really did put us in a really good position to, again, not be out there kind of, uh, you know, having to do heavily discounted launches just to, uh, to gain credibility. So I think this was a, Definitely an important milestone for the company to reach, and we're we're very happy to be able to announce that today. Thanks, guys. You know that that's super helpful. I, I appreciate all that um, context. Maybe just a, a quick follow up, uh, if I may. Um, can you maybe just remind us? You know, what are um, the outstanding uh, maybe catalysts or, or milestones for the neutron development that you think investors should be aware of, and and additionally. Maybe if you can give us a little more granularity on the uh, the hot fire test and the production of the additional engines there. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure, Andre. The, the best way I, I like to explain it is, is, and we tried to do a little bit of that in, in this in this presentation was you need to think of think of it as, as three kind of pillars. Um, you know, one you have launch infrastructure, and that's actually where the majority of the the capital flows into. And you know the things the things that everybody should be watching there is uh, you know is is you know stuff being built um, quite simply um, you know steel going in the ground concrete being poured and and uh, and things that look like a launch site now uh, thankfully that's relatively easy to follow because you know it's 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 sitting on the coast and and you know it, it's it's relatively you know easy to you know to get information on that and of course we we provide good updates um, so so that you know as long as steel is being built and shipped and propellant lines are running and all the rest of it, then you can feel pretty good about that. Um, and then the second pillar is kind of structures. Um, so you've seen, you know, full stage two tanks and flight configurations running uh, during wet dresses, fairings, um, first stage tanks. Uh, so, you know, as, as, you know as, as long as you keep seeing all those large structures, I think, um, think you, can, you can see that we're on track. Um, and uh, they all come together relatively late in the piece for, a, for an end-to-end -end wet dress rehearsal. And then, then with Archimedes, um, you know, we're in a we're in a test and qualification campaign. So, you know, what what we're doing with that engine is uh, is was we're finding it's called a run box basically. Is we're finding all of the all of the operational um, conditions of that engine um, and and defining you know what 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 they are. So, we have a kind of a, a desired run box, and then then we'll have an actual run box. Uh, and what we're looking to do is, uh, you know. Changing various intake pressures of the propellants and um, various operating points, and and really understanding uh, you know the engine and and what kind of idiosyncrasies that it, it may or may may not have. So you know that the the hot fire campaign reached a really important milestone you know last quarter where you know we 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 put a production engine. 
that was full of all production components, valves, hardware, software, and we took it to over 100% um, throttle level. So I think you know that that was a really important milestone. And working from that, it's it's just all about accumulating test time, um, putting the engine into you know uh, unknown conditions, and continue to 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 evolve the engine and increase its performance um, over time. And uh, you know I sort of made comment in in the the, the you know the script here that um, that you know, like an engine program it's 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 a long process. Yep, you can make fire and you can you can achieve uh, kind of preliminary targets and milestones, but um, you know uh, you, you you're always looking to improve either manufacturing or performance or reliability of an engine over many many years. So I think I think we're in a good spot, but um, but those those are the three things you know for for folks to track. Wonderful. I, I really appreciate all that color. Uh, congrats again on the quarter. I'll, I'll pass it on. Thanks, Andre. Your next question comes from the line of Edison Yu with Deutsche Bank. Your line is open. Hey, thank you for taking our questions and also congrats. I know you're not saying too much on the, on the Neutron Award, but maybe I could kind of ask from a different perspective. Can you provide any context in terms of what you won relative to if they the the customer had already placed the launch with someone else and they switched to you, or do they have other kind of maybe like soft contracts out there with other launch providers? Just is this? I know you say you could launch the whole thing. Just some context around uh, currently, what is the the piece that you that you have? Yeah, I mean, uh, look, um, you know, we probably can't 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 say too much, but uh, you know, it's 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 a customer that um, you know that, that that we know, and and um, as, as I as I mentioned, um, you know, we we were very strategic in in these, these especially these early launches um, about who who we want uh, to almost essentially partner with on on these um, these early contracts. So uh, look, I mean, you know, it's not, it's not my business to to um, you know to to get in, in, into their, their their kind of business, but um, but it, needless to say, you know, we we were we were happy with um, happy happy with that particular customer, and it's a, it's a good customer for you know the the stage and and phase of of the program. And Edison, maybe you got a little more a little more context to that. So. <clears throat> It, as, as you know, we've talked about in the past. You know, there's there there just are not that many companies in our space that have executed and are in a position to to to, to launch with, with any level of confidence. So, you know, you've got and you've got the added dynamic that you know there's a, a range of customers out there who you know also have payloads that compete with some of the other launch providers. And at this point, we feel probably more comfortable launching with somebody they don't necessarily compete with. So, I think that 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 plays into a lot of the discussions that we have and. You know, I would say that you know the the market remains pretty robust as far as demand is concerned. We you know when you look at the people that have capacity, a lot of that capacity has been spoken for. So really, we think Neutron is coming to market at at a at a great time where you know we're really filling a new need for for incremental capacity, and we're doing it in a way that's really non non competitive and non threatening with those customers. So um, you know, just a lot of the stars just are starting to align on on that for us with regards to Neutron. Understood. Understood. Then, then a follow-up question, a, a bit longer term. Uh, obviously, you've got you've got Frank on board now, and he comes from the automotive industry. And curious if you can maybe dimension the the kind of scale you're looking for. Uh, obviously, automotive is orders of magnitude higher scale than than aerospace. Is is Frank really coming on board to kind of take you to that you know much 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 higher level, or more to kind of get the existing backlog um, up, to, up, to, up to speed. Yeah, look, a bit of, a bit of both, Edison. And, and, you know, we have some components um, that are at, at low scale, like, you know, Mars spacecraft are never going to be produced at, at high scale. And then we have other things like reaction wheels where we produce thousands or thousands a year of. But the one thing about production, and I can attest this, is is that it, it, it all looks the same, whether whether you're building, a, you know, whether you're building a car or, or a spacecraft or a rocket, the production fundamentals are, are always the same. Now, yeah, of course, the you know the, the, the numbers that that roll off the end of the production line, you know, differ, but um, but all, all the manufacturing techniques and good practices remain the same. And 
you know, we've done we've done a great job um, here, and the team's done an amazing job here at, at scaling. But you know, as, as we look to um, you know to, to, to move even further um, up that up that curve, um, you know, having bringing someone on with this just such deep experience, not just within production production scaling, but within operations, it was just kind of you know the the, the right time for the company to you know to, to create that position. Fantastic. Thank you. And your next question comes from the line of Matt Akers with Wells Fargo. Your line is open. Yeah, hey, guys. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I, I wanted to ask about uh, space services. You, you guys kind of teased that on, on slide four. Um, just curious. I know you don't want to reveal what that could look like yet, but just curious what kind of time frame you had in mind. It seems like, you know, kind of the phase one and two are, are in pretty good shape. So I guess the to move to phase three, I mean, do we need to get Neutron sort of at a higher production cadence? Are there, you know, maybe more parts of the portfolio to, to fill in? Just curious how you think of kind of the timing there. Yeah, thanks, Matt. So, look, ev- everything is irrelevant without um, a reusable high cadence launch. Um, so, ne- Neutron is, is really the, the the key to to, to unlocking that. And, you know, if you look at uh, if you look at Starlink as a as a good example, you know, it's a great spacecraft. But actually, the thing that that has really made that that possible is a high cadence, low cost launch, um, and that and that in turn is made possible by a reusable launch vehicle. So you know, until until Neutron is flying at um, some level of cadence, it's kind of you know academic to talk about you know uh, deploying constellations. Yeah, got it. Okay, um, and, and just curious on uh, um, this this Neutron deal, or maybe just um, Neutron in general. Uh, thoughts on, on kind of what the progress payment maybe looks like on that. Just curious. I guess one, if if there's maybe some lumpiness and cash flow around that, just because those are, are pretty big. Big dollar items, and also uh, just how we should think about kind of the, you know, advanced payments versus kind of working capital aspect uh, at that program ramps up. Yeah, I can take that one, that one, Pete. So you know, each <clears throat> we have a fairly standard you know launch services agreement that we've obviously used many times with Electron, and we're leveraging most of that forward on uh, on Neutron. And I, you're you're right that you know building this you know this Neutron vehicle is it, it will be a um, uh, to, to challenging working capital cycle, at least initially, particularly when you think about the context here of uh, reusability, right? So I think, you know, we've never you know, said that we that we plan to basically uh, have a fully reusable vehicle for the first launch. So as we kind of work our way towards full reusability, you know, we'll be getting more kind of benefits from a working capital perspective as we do that. But, you know, the first, first few launches here are certainly going to be, you know, cash consuming. Um, so you can you can think about the structure. You know, most of these these LSAs have you know a deposit, and then there's milestone payments. And you know, if you look at our our um, electron business, typically we've collected about 60% of the contract value by the time we actually start building the rocket. Um, this might be a little bit different because you know it's the we're at the very early stages of kind of coming you know transitioning from R and D into production. But you can think of Neutron will should look very 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 similar to what we've kind of disclosed and kind of produced in our results uh, as we have with with, uh, with electron so I did nothing nothing too unusual with this one it's just you know it's, it's the first the first few rockets out of the shoot so you know kind of we got to go through that transition period and as we experienced also on electron the you know, electron you know came out initially with you know with 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 not kind of target margins obviously but as we kind of build towards that you know I think that you know there's a there's a combination of you know, the fact that, you know, we'll be collecting payments against, uh, you know, milestones in the contracts, but also getting production efficiencies and ultimately reusability, which is real, is the real key to kind of getting uh, Neutron to its target model, which we think will look very similar to the long-term model for uh, for Electron. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of context. Yes, that's very helpful. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Eric Rasmussen with Stiefel. Your line is open. Yeah, thanks uh, for taking the questions, and um, and congrats on the progress with Neutron. Um, maybe just uh, on that subject, Neutron, um, I know there's not a lot you want to really share at this time, but are you replacing anyone, or, or are you being brought on uh, to sort of, um, uh, you know, as another alternative, just because of, like Adam, you said there, you know, there's a number of, of, of medium rocket uh, rockets that are you know, in the market or or that will be 
potentially in the market in the coming years. But uh, is this just sort of, you think, a hedge uh, because you guys are a lot closer than some others? Yeah, I think with with respect to kind of commercial contracts, and in 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 some cases, yeah, definitely replacing. I would say that you know, Eric, in the in the NSSL world, it's 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 bringing on um, new providers. I think if you look at the you know the last NSSL uh, Lane One Phase Three award, a hundred percent of that award, a hundred percent of that award went to you know one particular launch provider because there was. You know, nobody else. So, in, in some case, the cases it's replacing, and, and in some cases, it's it's you know just being brought on as a as a, as a new alternative. Okay, um, and then um, you, you stated that uh, the ASPs you're going to be pretty uh, you know firm on on pricing. Is that the fifty to fifty five million that were that you initially talked about, and that's sort of where things have settled, maybe for these two dedicated uh, missions. And it says you're starting in mid twenty six. Would both of those potentially happen in twenty six, or how should we think about sort of timing, assuming you you do meet the mid twenty twenty five? Uh, for your first test launch. Yeah, I mean the the you know the, the launch pricing as we as we pointed out is is um, you know that was a really important thing for us and and um, you know I think I think I've, as I've said I've I made well I kind of had to but um, with with Electron it took us years to flush out bad bad kind of um, uh, you know. Contracts with respect to ASP. So no, we, we you know this this contract is is in line with um with, with uh you know with with our previously discussed um ASP for for for, for neutron, um and then uh you know on, on the you know we, we're selling real slots um with with real launch windows, um so we 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 kind of uh you know somewhat at the at, at the um you know the the, re, the bequest of, of of the customer. So you know, so the the, the twenty six timeframes for those launches, um, you know, are the are the customers, um, you know, driven requests. Gotcha. Um, then maybe just um, staying with la- uh, launch. Um, you're sitting at twelve uh, launches year to date. Um, you previously gave a range of fifteen to eighteen. Um, you have another one slotted uh, in the coming weeks. At the earliest, um, you would need sort of four uh, in this quarter to get to the bottom of that range. Um, but do you still feel like that's a, a viable range for you, the 15 to 18 where we sit today? I appreciate you not giving specific uh, guidance on that, but I just want to get a sense of your confidence level on that prior guidance of 15 to 18. Well, I mean, if, if if you recall, at the start of the year, we thought we were going to do 22, but um, but that so so I'm always always a little bit gun shy on this any, these these days. But um, but no, I think uh, you know we've we've got a certainly a very busy um, busy fourth quarter, uh, and you know at this stage, you know uh, uh, the, the customers are, are looking good, so I think we'll be within that range. Okay, um, and then just. Uh, on the NSSL, um, I just want to clarify, uh, the RFPs have opened up um, uh, pretty recently within the last two weeks. Um, does that mean you'll be available for this particular one, or it's the next cycle because of the time frame of Neutron at the earliest of mid-25? Yeah, the way the way it works is that um, you know you you have to you have to demonstrate uh, you know you, you can launch in, in 25 to be on ramped. And then once you're on ramp, on ramped, then you you'll bid for for various um, task orders. So there'll be, uh, you know, there's, there's kind of the, the task order is, is separate from from the from the on ramp, and those task orders, um, you know, are, are are released at you know at, at the times that that NSSL or the Space Force you know decides to. I think Eric, I think what what we're saying that you know even though we'll be on ramping in 2025, we wouldn't be awarded any any contracts for launch in 2025. And right now we're planning you know one test launch in 2025. We're talking about three launches in 2026, and then we've talked about five launches in 2027. And given kind of the discussion that we've had you know previously about uh, this this the first customer for Neutron that we announced today, you know that's obviously consuming some of that uh, capacity in 2026. So the the most likely scenario is that could could you see something in 2026 uh, for NSSL? 
it, you know, it's a possibility, but it's probably not the most likely scenario. That probably looks more like a, a, a you know, a 2027, but never say never. Right. Um, okay, great. And then just one last thing on, on the backlog of clarification, the, um, the 326 million for uh, launch, does that include this latest uh, uh, award win for the two for Neutron? No, it does not because that was a Q3 ending and this contract was signed post the end of Q3. Great. Okay. So it'll, it'll, back it'll, in the it'll, it'll show up in our Q4 backlog. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Suji Del Silva with Roth's Capital. Your line is open. Hi, Pete. Hi, Adam. Congrats on the progress and um, and the Neutron success here. The um, gross margin improvement here, um, Adam, is that the relative contribution between launch and space systems uh, sequentially in 3Q and 4Q relatively even? And can you give an update on the solar gross margin improvement? Is there a tailwind still there? But to, so the gross margin percentages are actually pretty close across. I mean, they're pretty consistent across launch and space systems right now. That's just a function of kind of, again, where we are in the margin improvement path for, for the launch part of the business. And then just kind of where we are on mix within space systems. Um, so, you know, if you look at the mix of our business being roughly 70% space systems, you know, 30% launch, I mean, that kind of gives you, it's all, it's all proportional. So, you just take the percentage of the business times the same rough margin you know, calculation and just apply it. Okay. And then on solar, Adam, does that remain a tailwind? Um, so, so solar is, uh, you know, solar has actually been progressing. I see it's a little bit slower than we thought. We've talked about that on some prior calls where, you know, we expected to be at target margins within, which was, you know, we said about 30% uh, non-gap gross margins of that business within two years of the acquisition. Um, you know, so we acquired that business in uh, early 2022. So we're a bit bit behind, but it's we're making steady progress. I would say when we look at our backlog for that business, we're really not booking. I can't remember the last time, maybe Pete can correct me. I can't remember the last time that we've actually booked business lower than our target gross margin. So it's all about kind of replacing, flushing out some of that older. In fact, there's really just one one bad contract in the mix that we inherited. Unfortunately, it was a large part of the, I think it was almost $100 million of the $150 million backlog at that deal close that came along that was, a, you know, basically essentially at zero margin. Um, so as we build the new business at target margins are better, you know, that's starting, to, that's starting to flow through now. We're seeing that come out, come through in a little bit more profound way. Um, and so I think that, you know, I think we all have actually probably more conviction now about getting to that 30% better uh, target gross margin for that business. It's just taken us a little bit longer. Um, and, and so I think, you know, the, the, it's also not too dissimilar to our launch business where it's a very kind of fixed cost oriented business. So when you have a good quarter where you're shipping a lot more product, you get the benefit of that overhead absorption. Um, and so, and as we mentioned earlier, and we mentioned in, in, uh, in our prepared remarks, the, the solar business is particularly strong in, in Q3. Okay. Great. And then my other question is on the launch business. I understand that Neutron is going to add to the backlog next, this quarter, but Electron growing $55 million. I'm just wondering what that, how, we, how that compares to the last few quarters. Is that uh, kind of in a range or is it accelerating? And what the drivers, if it is accelerating, are? Is it ASP trending up or um, any color there would be helpful? Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, we have, I'll have a crack at him. And, yeah, go ahead, Pete. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you, I'll have a crack and you can maybe add a bit more color as well. So, so launch is lumpy, like launch, actually launching the rockets is lumpy. So, so is, so is, you know, the contracts and, you know, um, they, 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 you know, we can go a quarter without uh, signing anything. So as far as historical kind of um, uh, lookbacks, I mean, uh, certainly this is a, this is, you know, been a good quarter for, for Electron, but it, te- it tends to be pretty lumpy, um, you know, throughout. Yeah, and if, if you if you look at certainly we we book more launches, and again as Pete said, it's, it's lumpy because we're we're chasing bigger multi-launch agreements, um, but also the you know the ASP has been very supportive. So I mentioned earlier that the average selling price for 2024 for Electron works out to be about seven and a half million per launch, and we've also talked on previous calls that our total backlog for Electron is priced at around 8.2 million dollars uh, ASP. So we're actually doing 
we're doing better on on booking at higher prices, so that that we're having a beneficial uh, ASP mix effect, um, and that's that's obviously helping contribute to the to the backlog growth, but also to what we believe is kind of a nice steady progress towards our tar- our uh, target margins for that electron business. Okay, very helpful. Thanks, guys. Mm-hmm. Your next question comes from the line of Andre Madrid with BTIG. The line is open. Adam, Peter, thanks for the time. Um, I know we kind of danced around it, but I wanted to just ask more specifically, how much was total neutron development cost in 3Q? Uh, I know previously you said about 160 for the year or about 40 mil a quarter. And also, like, is that kind of still an appropriate target uh, looking all in? Yeah, I'm scrolling up the number right now. Yeah, no, this in Q3, it was, it was, uh, Total, well, you have to split out between the different elements, but if you look at total net spend for Neutron across OPEX and CAPEX, it was just a hair under $44 million. Got it. Got it. Okay. And I think you know, that, 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 and that's going to, you know, that's, that's going to, you know, step up as, as kind of, as we continue to kind of get towards the, the first launch. So that's why this first launch of Neutron is, is so important for us. Um, because that really has such a tremendous impact on the P and L, right? Where we have all of this cost right now, just flow hitting hitting R and D. Uh, once you get past that first test launch and we carry the first paying customer, you know everything flips over. You've got now R and D associated with it, cost of sales and so forth. So it's a uh, you know it's a super important thing for us to get that first launch off because it kind of caps that initial spend because you'll have minimum viable product uh, both in the rocket and on the infrastructure side of the house. Um, and so I, and I think probably you know. Along with that, you know, we still feel very, very comfortable that we are, you know, we're within our target original budget for, for Neutron. And if you think about, you know, we, we, we talked, this is uh, going back, you know, when we came, we came public, you know, uh, three years ago now, a little over three years ago, we said it was going to take roughly three, four years and cost 250 to $300 million. And, you know, we put that in pretty stark contrast to what some other Kind of medium and larger launch vehicles have cost you know, in the many many billions of dollars and taken you know the better part of a decade to to get to to, to first launch. So we feel like we're we're on track and we're going to kind of set a new benchmark for you know capital efficiency and timing of getting a a new launch vehicle to the pad. Got it, got it. And if I could squeeze in one more, um, could you maybe highlight backlog at some of the non photon space systems businesses like? PSC, Sinclair, I mean, how, you know, how is, how is expansion and acquiring more business progressed at that line of business? Yeah, you know, those businesses continue to grow at a pretty healthy clip. If you look at our, you know, our, our target growth for the components business within space systems is around 20%. And we, in, and we feel very comfortable. We've been, you know, delivering you know, better than that, considerably better than that in some parts of our business. I would say that, you know, um, of our components businesses, uh, you know, Sinclair's probably had, you know, experienced the the most recent growth. And, you know, that's driven by, you know, the mega constellation reaction wheel contract that we've talked about in the past that, you know, has been, has been, uh, has been starting to ship. Um, but, you know, we, we've seen strength, you know, across, um, you know, across all of that. If you take it in, in aggregate, we kind of look at it across all of it. And when you look at our merchant business or the components business, there's really two pieces to that. There's the merchant components that we sell into other spacecraft manufacturers, and then there's the the integrated or vertically integrated supply element where we're now supplying our own feed, if you will, into these spacecraft manufacturing um, projects that we've won, like SDA and like uh, the MDA Global Star. So it's really it kind of the the growth is fueled not only by overall macro growth in in the broader merchant market, but also from our own to our own internal consumption as well. So we feel really good about you know. And continuing a 20% CAGR for that business, I think, you know, some will be stronger than those, right? Like this year, I said, we're having more strength in Sinclair, and that probably continues through next year. Uh, and then, you know, as we look forward into 2025 and 26, based on a lot of these big programs, you know, we're going to have very good years for our solar, too, because, you know, we're dedicating a, a significant amount of our capacity to, to internal programs. Um, and overall, you know, it it's actually has a very healthy um, you know, kind of roadmap, I would say, for, for gross margin as well. If you look at the, the, the components or subsystems business, that's kind of in the already in the I call it low to, to mid 40s non-gap gross margin. 
Um, and we think there's some upside to that. Um, and then there's just the kind of a little bit of the offset where you have these bigger, you know, program gross margin models that are kind of more towards call it 30%. So you've got that blending effect there, but um, we feel really good about, you know, all the elements of that, uh, that, that subsystem business. And, and since you brought it up, um, what's the mix between what's go, what goes in house for components versus what's, you know, delivered as a merchant supplier. And do you guys have a target mix for for space systems? I guess. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I, I don't have that data at the tip of my fingers, um, and I don't really want to tr- try to guess on that. I mean, I think for some some of the businesses we have a little bit more visibility. So I'd say, for example, I think in our in our solar business, I think our internal capacity consumption right now is probably only about ten percent. So ninety percent is going out to the merchant market to. You know, a lot of the the, the 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 people that sell into the national security market for these exquisite systems. Um, when you look at uh, the separation systems business, for example, we sell uh, a much more externally than we consume internally. Just the fact because you know it's the it's it's one of the most predominant separation systems that flies on basically all rockets. Um, so it really there really is there really is a, a mix. Um, and, but that's a good question. We can certainly follow up offline and see if we can we can get you a more kind of concrete answer to that. Yeah, definitely. I would appreciate that. Adam, thanks so much for the call. I really appreciate it. Sure. The next question comes from Jason Gersky with City. Your line is open. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Pete, I want to have you just walk us all through, if you don't mind, one more time why it is that we have to do one, three, and five. Um, and if there isn't an opportunity to go a little faster here, you suggest that, you know, history would suggest with others, you got to do it that way. But why is that the case? Um, and Adam, you talked about throwing CapEx. There are some more CapEx coming into the mix here. Is this, is this a, something we can throw some capital at and, and speed things up a bit? Jason, you asked the question that, that Adam asked me every day. And um, there's, some, there's some things in, in, that, that you can throw as much capital as you want, but um, until you fly, um, the, you know, you, you can only learn, learn a certain number of things. And um, look, 135 is, uh, is, is a pretty, um, you know, pretty, pretty, good, pretty good scaling rate um, at, at, at best. And you know, fun- fundamentally, you know, you fly your first rocket, and um, you know, you'll you'll do you do the best job that you you think you can. There's there's a whole lot of stuff you can test on the ground, and then there's a whole lot of stuff you can't test on the ground. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's it's just a, well, obviously, Ford build as as many of the components that we think in many of the systems and the structures as, as as we can. But um, you can find yourself just you know in a in a in a dead end pretty quickly. Um, but it also it just it just takes it just takes time to scale the the production line um, and we you know we've tried to we've tried to front end it as loaded as best we can you know with the engine production line generally the, the engines um, are the other you know the, the longest pole in the tent from from a production perspective so you know we've really we've really leaned into that so hopefully we can do better um, but uh, it just it just takes time to put one on the pad and and commission it and learn it and learn from it and then roll those iterations into the next vehicle, and you know we, we're we're flying customers' payloads, so um, you know everything has to be very methodically thought through and every change is you know well qualified, um, you know to you know to to, to reach that cadence. I guess it, it's a, it might be a slightly different story if, if you had no customers and you just would just you just threw everything at it and, and had a different risk posture. But you know we're looking to get into commercial operations as quickly as we can. So um, when you're flying a customer, you, you you can't just kind of be fast and loose. You have to be very methodical in any of the changes that you that you, that you roll in. So. Um, and we we just we just don't want to be unrealistic with with what what's been you know what can tangibly de- be delivered. But Jason, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll be I'll be asking Pete that question every day going forward as well. So <laughs> okay. about that. Yeah, if you, <laughs> yeah. you can do it on my behalf, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. And then you know, Pete, look, um, one, three, and five. Okay, so we've got six launches, one's a test. Um, but as you look at the pipeline, I mean, over that time period, if you had more capacity, um, is there more demand out there? I just want to 
and, and maybe strip out yeah. the national security launch just on the commercial side of things. I'm just trying to get a better gauge of supply and demand uh, equilibrium. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's the fundamental reason why you're asking this question, Adam asks this question, everybody asks this question, is how, how can we scale faster? Um, and, and, and indeed yeah. customers. Um, but the worst thing you can do is, is you, you know, promise a customer that, you know, there's, you, you're going to be able to provide a whole bunch of launch. They, they make a big commitment to you and then you don't deliver because that, that, that's just, it, it plays havoc with their business. So that's not good for, you know, not good for their business or, or long-term you know, long-term relationships, or quite frankly, our reputation. So, um, so of all the things we worry about, and I think we've said before, demand's not one of them. Um, we worry more about how how fast can you know how fast can we can we scale the neutron, um, rather than you know are there are there customers there to you know to fly on it for sure. Right. Okay. Then last one for me. Um, <clears throat> I'm just kind of curious. We've got a new administration coming to town. Um, Let's see here. I guess what uh, what policy statements have you heard uh, to date that uh, you know uh, either have you encouraged or um, are giving you a little bit of pause? And um, you know what would you suggest we hear on the outside, kind of pay attention to here as this transition happens? What are you what are you going to be looking for and looking to hear from the new administration? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so I, I think, I, you know, what I take out of it is that um, I don't think there's ever been such a focus on space from any administration, um, you know, perhaps, perhaps you know, back in the Apollo era. But, I mean, uh, it's, it's very clear that this administration has a very strong focus on, on space, um, which, which is good. And when space wins, Rocket Lab wins. Um, also, you know, we see a very strong focus on national security, um, uh, which is obviously a core part of our business. But I guess probably the thing I'm, I'm most excited about is is uh, there's a real focus on moving away from the, the kind of you know slow government contracting and and really focusing on commercial providing much more uh, of of the you know traditional um, you know space and, and government services which is which is really when you think about it there's only a few companies that are, are really well positioned to um, you know to take advantage of those commercial opportunities and and us being one of them so you know uh, look I, I look out on the new administration with with uh, with, with uh, you know quite quite a quite a bullish outlook given that given given those kind of three things. Right. Okay. Great. I'll pass the line. Appreciate it. And your next question comes from the line of Michael Lishock with KeyBank's Capital Markets. Your line is open. Hey. Thank you. I wanted to ask on space systems. You've talked about both organic and inorganic ways to scale the business. Was just hoping for an update there on the M and A pipeline. Whether you see any new opportunities, and then secondly, you also have those organic initiatives like additional clean room capacity that you already have the footprint for. Um, just wondering if you could provide some more details there, and how much is left? How much is left to go on those initiatives? Thanks. I can take a swing at this, Adam, and maybe you. you um can can follow it up um, on on the kind of the the, the you know organic stuff. Um, you know we 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 have we always have a number of um, new products and and things in development. Some some of those are spin-offs from some of the programs that we're developing. Some of them are just areas that we think there's a market opportunity for. And and you know the way the way we kind of talk about those is, is obviously you, you know you've seen in the past product releases from us so that that will you know and when, when we have when we have something that we think is, um, is is ready then we'll release it and I think we have uh, you know a pretty strong reputation that you know we release it when it's done we don't we don't kind of you know talk about it and, until really it's 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 done and you saw that with um, even reaction wheels or Something like the haste missions, you know, we announced a haste mission, and then, 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 you know, a number of weeks later, we launched one. So, that 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 that's kind of the way we roll with 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 um, organic product development. And then, um, in organic, you know, we we always maintain a pretty healthy pipeline. And and um, you know, maybe Adam, you you can provide a bit more comment on that. Yeah, I'd say on the on the corporate development front, we continue to to look at a lot of assets out there. I think that. You know, one thing is we're very selective, right? So I think if you look at the assets that we've that we've acquired in the past, 
you know, the team is always at the center of it. And you know, if you look at the fact that, you know, you, you pick any one of the deals, they've always been leading products in their, in their area. You pick, you know, from solar where they've never had a single failure on orbit, you know, to bringing new kind of innovative capabilities to the market through the, you know, the software capabilities for command and control software for ASI and separation systems from PSC and so forth. So it's, it's really, um, you know, I would say we continue to look at things and what we we've largely gotten the, the bus, the satellite bus, into a point where we have most of the capabilities there that we think that we need to 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 be kind of that to fulfill the end to end requirements there. There's still a few little things here and there that that we're working on, and we're actually trying to address those in some of those organically as well, not just inorganically. But probably the biggest missing piece to space systems uh, from a uh, uh, you know that's going to be filled likely through uh, inorganic is going to be on the payload side. So we really kind of stop at the, at the payload right now. And, you know, certainly as we, you know, we've talked many, many times about our large, our grander ambitions of, of having our own applications on orbit, you know, that's going to be benefited by having our own internal capabilities around the payload side of, of, of the system. So, you know, there's, there's fortunately for us, there's actually quite a few assets out there that are quite interesting that are, are kind of, um, I'd say poised to be part of a of a much bigger you know consolidated platform like we're building. So I think there's there's ample opportunities there, but you know we're very disciplined. It's got to be the right team. It's got to be the right time. It's got to be the right price. And so far we haven't gotten those three stars to align, but you know I'm I'm pretty confident that uh, that we'll get some of those stars to align in the not too distant future. And I think that will also provide a bit of a breadcrumbing for po- for folks to understand a little bit more specifically which applications we're targeting because, you know, a lot of the, the payload is obviously very specific to the application. Um, and so having, having kind of, you know, some insight into kind of the capabilities that we'd be acquiring would kind of give you some ideas about where we're going from an application's perspective, which I know everyone's, you know, chomping at the bit to try to understand better. Okay, great. I appreciate all that detail. I'll leave it there. Thanks guys. Your next question comes from the line of Anthony Valentini with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my question. You got Anthony on uh, for Noah tonight. Um, sorry to, to beat this point to death here, but um, it's been pretty well publicized at this point that uh, Amazon's Kuiper has to get, um, you know, over a thousand satellites into orbit, you know, I think by mid-2026. Um, and they have orders with some of your competitors for launch vehicles that either um, have not launched yet or in very limited cadence. Um, so I guess my question is, you know, do you guys stand to benefit from that um, between now and, and 2026 um, where you guys can get, you know, a piece of that pie? Or is it, you know, to, uh, you know, what Peter was talking to in an, in an earlier um, answer, it's just not possible given, you know, capacity and um, how many slots that you guys have available. Well, I'll put it this way, as we said, Anthony, that demand is not something that we worry about, um, and that kind of falls falls in falls into that that category. Okay, um, that's helpful. And then, um, Adam, for you, is the systems segment profitable today? Well, you know, we we only report our segments down to the gross margin line, and that's because we have a lot of you know shared resources across uh, across the different uh, areas of development and production and so forth. And also, you know, we have one key decision you know maker, which is Pete, who kind of provides the overall kind of investment decisions or mandates across both businesses. So we you know we from an I would say from a uh, from a technical accounting perspective. You know, we 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 can't say that the space systems business is 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 profitable on that level. Um, but what we can tell you is that you know, when we look at you know, kind of anecdotally across each of the lines of business, um, it, it would be it be it would be safe to say that you know the the that the vast vast majority, if not all, of the the cash consuming nature of this business is coming from neutron. Right. So. Um, I think that's, again, that's one of the most important things about getting Neutron to a minimum viable product in the first launch up. Things will become a lot, a lot more clear at that point. Um, as in, and actually at some level doesn't really matter because then the overall profitability of the company starts to shine through. So, you know, again, I, I would say that we, we can't, we can't say, you know, technically that space systems is profitable at this point because we just don't account for the business at that level right now. Uh, that could change in the future, but that's, that's not the current, um, kind of approach we take to it. 
Okay. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Last one for me here. Um, I just want to confirm the test flight on Neutron in 2025. That That's no revenue, right? Correct. Yeah, there won't be any revenue associated with that launch. Um, but we are working on things that would allow us to have, you know, probably some contra revenue, uh, sorry, contra R&D associated with that. So looking to do some creative things there where we can kind of buy down our cost of that test launch. Um, and so that's uh, that's something that we're working pretty hard towards, and, and hopefully we can get uh, we can get some of that to, to come into focus. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate the time. Yep. Your next question comes from the line of Kai Von Rummer with TD Cohen. Your line is open. Super. Thanks so much. Um, so, Adam, your your uh, your ASPs for Electron have gone down sequentially for three straight quarters, and yet your gross margin has improved. Now, I know that costs are kind of specific to to each mission, but what does that tell us about uh, the underlying core profitability of Electron? Mm. Yeah, it's really a function of of, of so when you talk about uh, you know ASP. ESP is a function of customer timing, right? And so we have some customers that, you know, sign up for many launches. And as a result of signing up for these bulk buys, they naturally get a lower price. Um, and we get the benefit of having actually better margins on, on a lot of those flights because a lot of the work is doesn't have to get redone. All the, you know, the, the GNC work that you have to do for each individual flight, you know, you don't have to redo that. You get maybe the benefit of having payload adapter plates that are common, you know, across multi-launch deals. Um, so, a lot of what you're seeing, the, the ASP is, a, again, just a function of timing of where the customer wants to land. And so, we're, again, we're very comfortable kind of with the number that we set for the year at $7.5 million being the average. And, of course, as I mentioned before, our backlog, total backlog is priced at $8.2 million per electron. So that kind of shows you where it's going. Um, and then, you know, even the, the reason why the gross margin has gone up, um, despite having the, chat, the, uh, the, the, the optics on the, on the ASP, is because we've been getting production efficiencies. Right. So as we've gotten better at building these electrons, you know, the cost is coming down, which, which, is, which is helpful for us. So even as ASP may go down, gross margins go up. Um, I think that, that's kind of the, the, I the, the, the most salient points of, of, of kind of the gross margin trend analysis. Got it. And the second one is, um, you, you know, you started the year, Peter, you mentioned that at 22 launches sort of scheduled or targeted, and we're going to probably end up at 15 to 18. Um, have you ever thought, I mean, and, and one of the big problems is that you commit to a certain price and the customer commits to a certain date, but it's not a hard date. Have you ever thought of a kind of... Uh, pricing so that if the customer misses, the price goes up. And I know that you have other competitors, but certainly if you could get your uh, number of launches up, you've made a big point of how high the, uh, the the fixed launch costs are. Is there any thought of kind of getting that, that, uh, that volume, you know, thinking of ways, creative ways of getting that, that volume up? Yeah, I mean, some some launch contracts have provisions for penalties, um, uh, and but I mean, it, you know, if if a, if a customer has had a failure of something in a TVAC, um, and then then you start loading penalties on them, uh, you know, it's not it's not great for long term relationships. And I think that the 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 learnings here for us, um, and I think for every, everybody as well, is that that the service that we provide is is a bespoke, um, dedicated. Service for for you know for customers to launch and they pay the premium for that. Um, you know, a, a, an elect, you compare an electron to a rideshare, it's 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 many many times higher. So they pay that, that's what they're paying the premium for. Um, I guess you know the, the point that we we try and make is that um, you know once a customer goes into backlog and we start collecting you know the cash from from um, from that customer, you know, these, these 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 customers never go away. They just sort of shift around. Um, it's just a peculiarity of the way that, you know, revenue is, is recognized um, on launch. So, no, I think, I think you know, um, we, 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 we've, we, we continue to, you know, play launch, launch whack-a-mole and wherever possible, like you see, we, we did in the last quarter, you know, we'll take quick turns business and, and fill, some, fill some gaps. But it's, it's kind of, you know, the, the, you know, really the, the reality of the service that, that we provide. 
Terrific. Thank you so much. And there are no further questions at this time. I will turn the call back over to Peter Beck for closing remarks. Great, and th thanks very much for everybody uh, sticking around for the the, uh, the, the the questions as well. Much appreciated. Um, but uh, before we close out today, I just wanted to draw your attention to some of the up and coming conferences we'll be attending. Uh, we we'll look forward to sharing more exciting news and, and updates uh, with with you there. Um, but that wraps up today's call, and, and thanks everybody um, uh, for for uh, sticking around and, and listening to um, all the progress that's been made. Um, you know, the team is, is certainly very proud uh, of this quarter and, and what we've achieved this year. So, thanks very much. This does conclude today's conference. You may now disconnect.